Hi, good afternoon. So um, this is a um, webinar from Zimmer and Peacock. And the reason we're doing this webinar is because um, we did a webinar with um, Chemical Angels um, last Thursday. And it was very nice that it was well attended and there were a lot of um, follow-up requests um, and a copy of the um, presentation. Now, at the time, I wrongly thought that there wasn't a copy made, but I've since discovered um, in fact, a copy is available, but we, in the meantime, decided to do this presentation. So we're going to talk about trends and developments in biosensors. Um, I'm pretty sure we've um, gone live at the moment, so I can see a few um, people. So I'm just going to say, um, say hello if, uh, if you can hear us. So I will dive straight into it. Um, but we're also streaming, as you can tell, um, straight to um, YouTube as well at the moment. So um, let me um, start off with just giving a, um, a quick introduction. So this talk is about trends and developments um, in biosensors. And great. It's trends. In the, so thank you, uh, Vasanth, for um, confirming you can hear us. So we're going to talk today about... Um, very briefly about Zimmer and Peacock. So when I gave this original talk to the Chemical Angels Network, um, hosted by my good friend Mark Vreek, I made a point that we wouldn't talk too much about Zimmer and Peacock. So I'm going to hold true to that original statement and just say that Zimmer and Peacock is a um, ISO 13485 um, contract developer and um, manufacturer of um, biosensors. Um, let me just click to here. Um, if you want to know about us, we're, we've got the website for ZimmerandPeacock.com. Um, we have um, our social media channels. If some of the terms that we're going to use today um, are unknown to you, um, then um, feel, feel, feel free to um, check out our ZP Academy. On the ZP Academy, there are two um, courses that are completely free, Introduction to Biosensors and Electrochemical Techniques for Biosensor Developers. This is a really important way of interacting with us at Zimmer and Peacock, and that's um, our um, hey cool. Um, that's our ZP Developer Zone, and I can also see that um, Aftab has come online as well. So thank you, Aftab. So as I say, this this talk has been given at the Chemical Angels um, Network, but I just felt like you know we needed to have um, a copy on YouTube, so I was going to um, give it again. So just to say, Zimmer and Peacock. Um, now, if you can see at me at the moment, I'm actually in our new facility in the UK. So we have a number of facilities. We have a small one in London, and we have this larger one in um, Coventry in the UK. And then the image I'm showing at the moment is a 4,000 square meter facility in a little town called Horton. But it's also worth saying that we have a further two facilities even in that town. But this is the biggest facility we have. It's a fully equipped, very modern um, facility. and um, Hopefully, some of you who are members of the developer zone will um, come and visit us. And let me just. Um, so, I'm going to talk about trends and developments in biosensors today. So, this is a little bit more of looking to the future of biosensors. Many of the talks we do on biosensors about the history of biosensors or you know where we're currently at with biosensors. And this one's looking a little bit further ahead. And so, today we're going to talk about markets in biosensors. Um, the biggest market in the biosensing to date is um, health, in my opinion, but um, biosensing is developing into wellness and into sports applications. Um, many of you who maybe follow us on the ZP Developer Zone will know about um, that we're very interested in food, agriculture, and aquaculture. So I will talk about, just briefly, about our food sense technology. I will talk about continuous monitoring and nitrate in the soil. and You'll also see a very small sort of sensing system from us for uh, measuring um, the um, glucose and cortisol in fish. So some of the, one of the futures of biosensing is new markets. And within those markets are new, um, new trends. So I'll talk about the trend towards um, point of need testing. So... You know, we'll talk about this quite a bit, but it's essentially people no longer want to test in central laboratories. They want to be able to test on their smartphone in the field and get an instant result. Um, 
one of the futures of biosensing is continuous monitoring. People don't just want to measure their blood glucose four times a day. They want to continually know their blood glucose um, so that they can essentially improve their glycemic control. Um, one of the futures of biosensors is the sensors won't be, um, you won't bring the sample to the sensor. The sensor will be constantly on you doing continuous monitoring of you, and that will be a wearable um, format. Um, one of the directions of biosensing is long term implantable. I'll show you an example from Zimmer and Peacock, and I'll also show you an example from a company called Sensorian. People are very interested in new types of samples. So by new samples, for example, you know, there's been a lot of work done on monitoring in the blood, but there's not been so much work done on um, monitoring on the breath. Um, one of the things that's quite close to our hearts um, is the Internet of Things. So people are very interested in now in, you know, and generally in connectivity to the web. And that interest is also helping to grow the biosensor market as well. I think one of the things that's made the biggest difference in biosensing is actually um, the increase in the number of very skilled engineers in this world that can deal with AI and data science. Um, I think one of the trends is it's always been a technology that sort of periodically comes back, which is electronic noses and electronic um, tongues. And um, a very, I think this is probably a moment in history when actually we can probably do this um, stuff. So I'm just saying hi to one of the guys that's joined us online. Um, and let me just, uh, other things that we'll talk about today are fabulous manufacturing. And fabulous manufacturing is a concept. Um, if you Google fabulous manufacturing, you will find um, big references in the electronics industry. But we will touch upon fabulous manufacturing. Um, so let's dial, dive into this kind of health and um, wellness um, market. So let me just check here. Right. What is the direction in the health and wellness market? The direction is this. Um, people are or people have access to large clinical analyzers in centralized laboratories. But during this COVID-19 crisis, um, there's been an increasing awareness of um, RDT, rapid diagnostic testing. The sort of grandfather or one of the you know, oldest technologies in the market for RDT is the um, glucose strip testing. They sometimes call it SMBG, self-monitoring blood glucose, where you prick your finger, you get that little drop of um, blood um, on the um, sensor, and that capillary, that, that wicks onto the glucose sensor. We have an electrochemical, sorry, we have a biochemical reaction and when we can detect by electrochemistry. So that's very popular. Um, now there's also in the last year, you know, lateral flow has always been something that's known to us in the world of biosensing, but it's become known more known to us in the world of um, because of COVID-19. I think it's become more generally um, aware in the in the world as well. Um, so the direction of flow in the health market is the essentially taking tests that were traditionally done in the laboratory and moving them out um, to the field. And this is a kind of example of point of care testing or point of need testing. And I think many people who, you know, uh, uh, the resolution of the screen slide seems very low. Yeah. So um, I just had a little comment online that the resolution seemed very low. I can tell you that the internet speed here is blistering. I've never seen such fast internet. As I say, we're in our new laboratory um, in, um, in Coventry in the UK. Now, one of the directions in, of technology development has actually been the um, miniaturization. So I have said in previous slides that, you know, we started off with these big clinical analyzers. Um, it's gone smaller to tabletop. So the tabletop instrument that I'm showing you at the moment is... Um, it's called the Abaxis Piccolo. When I gave this talk initially at the Chemical Angels Network, there was a gentleman in the audience who was actually one of the, um, um, what, he was one of the um, inventors of that technology. So we're very delighted that he was there um, and, you know, and, and saw the talk. So we start off with big, um, let's say, analyzers. 
and it shrunk down to tabletop instruments. Um, it shrunk down to, let's say, handheld instruments. This is called the iStat. Um, it's currently manufactured by a company called Abaxis. And so you can, you know, you can get cartridges for glucose and lactate with these guys, things like potassium. So clinical analyzers, tabletop instruments, handheld instruments, um, not too surprising. It's gone down to um, palm size. I think this is the one touch by um, LifeScan, um, manufactured in Scotland, in the UK. And where are we going to now? And now wearables. So um, this is the Abbott Freestyle Libre. And so, you know, if you looked at glucose, you know, people start off with clinical analyzers, desktop instruments, handheld instruments, palm sized instruments, and now wearables. And so my next slide, or my next animation is not that surprising. A big, big direction in biosensing has been miniaturization all the way down to wearables. And wearables has really only come about properly, I would say, in the last decade. And We'll touch upon that quite a bit um, in today's. So I say, I'll say it on the next slide, you know. Um, what are the things that people are, are focused on in wearables? And the things that people are focused on is um, diabetes. I mean, it's, you know, unfortunately, it's a chronic disease. It's a global disease. Um, and it's a big market and people are very focused on it. People are a little bit interested in cystic fibrosis but i'll talk about the economics of cystic fibrosis in a bit um people are very interested in measuring athletes for lactate there is no lactate center on the market at this moment for athletes there's probably you know more than a dozen startups doing it but there isn't one on the market at the moment um everyone is interested in cortisol um measurement uh, for stress and wellness um, you know, we we get inquiries all the time about cortisol. Um, now, hydration is interesting. Um, people are very interested in it. I think it's quite it's quite hard to actually define what being hydrated or dehydrated is. To you can have an opinion on it. Um, I think the gold standard for understanding um, what hydration is is something called total body water. I think it's called TBW total body water um, and so if you can know somebody's total body water then you can understand whether they're hydrated hydrated or dehydrated but to understand somebody's total body water the way you do it is you'll take a known volume of an isotope you'll drink it you'll then urinate it out and they'll look at the dilution of that isotope in your urine and that'll be able to tell you what the total body water was of that person that's the kind of gold standard for measuring hydration. A secondary way of doing it is to use, um, in, um, I want to say it's um, body impedance. But if you see these scales where people can stand on these scales, and it can start, send essentially, it can measure the resistance up the leg, across the groin and down the other leg. That's another way of trying to estimate the, um, somebody's hydration, but that's really an estimate. So. The reason I'm saying all this is when developing a hydration sensor, it's quite hard because you find it very hard to say what the gold standard is for measuring hydration. If you walk into a doctor's clinic and you ask him and he wants to determine whether you're hydrated or not, what he'll actually do is just pinch the back of your skin. But that's not quantifiable. That's a very qualitative test. And so I'm just saying hydration, everyone wants to do it. Ask them to give you the gold standard for measuring hydration and they struggle and therefore it's hard to develop new sensors because you have no agreed standard against which to um, test anyway um, the other wearable that I think is worth a comment is um, wound healing um, people talk about it companies try to do it but nobody's done a product as yet and it's a very um, it's very doable but I think the business model is what people struggle on. So things of interest that we'll talk about today are diabetes. I apologize for talking so much about diabetes, but it is you know, a massive part of the biosensor market. Um, I'm not really gonna talk about lactate too much, but I will talk about cystic fibrosis and I will touch upon um, hydration. Um, just to say, 
the only two wearable biosensors, um, um, the only two bio, the only two wearable biosensors on the market is one for cystic fibrosis, and there are three, at least three, on the market for diabetes. Now, I just had a question come through from Safiq, which is asking um, Sa Saif Siddiqui, who's asking about the accuracy. The fact is, you cannot. I don't believe with a wearable sensor get the accuracy that you can get with a clinical analyzer. But I think people should not try to compete with a clinical analyzer. Um, you know, if you're a if you're a type one diabetic, then knowing your continuous glucose um, value in real time, you know, can end up saving your life. So there's really no competition with that and a clinical analyzer. A clinical analyzer will always be more accurate than a wearable sensor, but you just can't carry a lab around with you. Um, so, yeah. How does ZP overcome the challenges? How does ZP overcome the challenges? How does ZP overcome the, cha overcome the challenges? Um, it's not mentioned explicitly in these slides, but actually, you know, in order to make a CGM sensor and to do it at a high standard, most of the companies on the market have spent at least $50 million doing it. So it's all solvable, but it's not an engineering challenge. There's no secret source. It's actually effort, and effort equals investment. So how do we do it? We do it through good sensor design, good electronics, um, good data science, and we have large teams on these um, pro types of programs. Uh, I was asked this in a previous version of this webinar, and we spend about 10,000 hours per year on um, doing continuous glucose monitoring type projects over several years. So it's how to make sensors good, it's effort. And it's called it's effort by the right types of people as well. Yeah. If, you've got, if, you, if you don't have the right people, then there's no point in putting all that effort in. But if you've got the right team and the right budget, you can afford the right effort. Um, right, just some comments about cystic fibrosis. Um, now, there is a technology in the market for measuring cystic fibrosis in newborns, but it's not something that a lot of us have heard about. And the reason being is this is the, you know, the sad truth about biosensing is um, there are um, 10,000 sweats um, tests performed per year on infants in the USA. And there's 2,900 sort of tests done in part of clinical studies. That means there's 12,900 tests done in the US, which is you know, often the biggest market for health technology. Even if we were selling those sensors at $400, that, that business would only be worth $5 million or have a revenue of $5 million. It's just not enough to get um, investors excited. So you can identify a clinical need for a test. But if the population, unfortunately, of people who require it is quite small, it doesn't make business sense to do something. Now, obviously, you know, that's not the case um, for CGM. I've apologized a couple of times that this uh, presentation will talk about CGM quite a bit. But the elephant in the corner is, you know, cystic fibrosis, there is a technology for it. Why have we not heard of it? Because it's a very niche application. I mean, if you look at... Um, CGM, continuous glucose monitoring, then that market's worth about 10 billion by 2027. And, um, you know, you've got three major players in there all sort of, you know, politely battling with each other for this market. You've got Abbott, Dexcom, and Medtronic. You know, and I just saw, um, I have a good friend on LinkedIn. He just sent me a link to talk, talk about the Apple technology now that, you know, but Apple and Google are trying to get in on this. So it really does tell you that you know cgm is a you know it's a market that's worth your efforts because it's got these big players the bigger guys are trying to get into it and we'll talk about these technologies so this is a presentation about trends um, and developments in the biosensor market um, and i'm sorry that a lot of this these slides are about cgm but i can't apologize because it is such a big you know application so bear with me and, you know, we will talk about other applications as well. Two of the elements um, for CGM, um, you're going to require some electronics. This is the smallest set of electronics we've made for biosensors at the moment. It's, that's my finger. So for scale, you can see my finger here, hopefully. 
So it's a pretty small set of electronics, um, and the sensor itself um, is a what we call a wire sensor. So this is the Abbott um, Freestyle Libre. I'm just showing you that as an example. That's not our technology, but I just want to show you that the two main components that go into these kind of CGMs are electronics and a um, and a disposable sensor, a semi-disposable sensor as well. And um, where are we today? Where we are today is we've got three people on the market in terms of um, continuous glucose monitoring. And um, we've got Abbott, Medtronic, and Dexcom. And many of them are just really a derivative of um, some work by a gentleman called um, George Wilson. Um, and he published his paper in 1992. So he made a glucose oxidase sensor on a platinum wire um, with silver silver chloride as the reference. And he said she made that work, and many of the sensors, um, many of the sensors on the market are actually derivatives of these. So, if you're interested in that original paper, uh, progress towards the development of implantable sensor for glucose by George Wilson. Now, this is a presentation of how direction and trends. So, I'm not going to give you a history lesson. Just that one slide, I think. Where's the market moving towards? This is a company called BioLink. This is their um, image. This is their technology. They're making micro needles. So the market is moving towards um, not so much transdermal, which is how I describe the Abbott, Medtronic, and um, Dexcom technology. People are going for minimally invasive. And one way to go minimally invasive is micro needles, and BioLink is a company down in San Diego. That's what they're doing. I took a look at their patents. Um, and on their patents, they have counter electrode, working electrode, reference electrode, functionalized working electrode. So it tells us something about what they're doing. You know, their patents are telling us what they're actually doing. Um, micro needles are particularly hard to make. Um, there's only a few companies in the world that do it. Um, we do it. BioLink can clearly do it as well. When you're talking about micro needles, um, there are generally two fra two factions. There's um, solid and hollow. If you've got a solid microneedle, you have a solid structure in which you've put the enzyme, and that goes through the skin and into the interstitial fluid, so the ISF, that layer of liquids just underneath the um, skin, and um, you sense down in the interstitial fluid. There's another type of microneedle, which is a hollow microneedle, which pierces through the skin, and the liquid flows up through the center and onto the sensor. I don't have a slide on a company called Sano Health, but I'm pretty sure if I've, when reading um, Sano Health, that they have a hollow micro needle. So, where we are today is wire sensors, which are transdermal. Where it looks like we're going is micro needles. And even in micro needles, there's two subtleties the solid and hollow. Um, now, this might look like another history lesson. This slide says, you know, going back in time, reverse iontophoresis. Now, reverse iontophoresis, uh, some of you will yawn when I tell you about the Gluco watch from a company called Cygnus. This was launched in about 2000, and it uses a, the picture I've just shown here is a gentleman called Russ Potts. He should, um, him and his team should be given credit for inventing this. Um, now, reverse iontophoresis and the glucose watch, as I say, was launched about 2000. They were effectively applying voltage and flowing a current and drawing um, glucose out through the skin um, using this process of reverse iontophoresis. In those days, they had um, some technical issues and it caused um, a bit of blistering um, of the skin and the product was, um, was removed from the market. But this technology has come off patent now and so now there's a renaissance um i think an interest in this technology because it was patent protected the patents have um let's say um, expired and so people are now sort of interested in revisiting and um, this technology so trends and trends and directions sometimes we go slightly back in time because for a while there we couldn't work in this technology because it was patent protected I think another analogy I would give on that is 3D printing. 3D printing has suddenly finally exploded, let's say, in the last five years. Um, 
But actually, the technology was around a lot longer than that. But there were some key patents in place that were blocking things like the MakerBot from coming to the market. But then the patents expired. MakerBot came in the market. Uh, hi, Ali. Um, the MakerBot came on the um, market and suddenly the 3D printing market took off. So I'm just saying there's an analogy with also with iontophoresis that um, the patents have expired and the, now I think there's a lot more interest um, in people um, adopting this kind of technology. So let me just... Um, so it, there is a case of history repeating itself. Um, so this is a company called um, C8 that were around approximately... Um, seven, eight, nine years ago, um, they were using a technique called Raman spectroscopy to look through the skin and trying to detect um, glucose. Um, now, the reason I bring it up is because when you're looking at the Apple patents, you know, so Apple are you know coming out with my, I have my Apple Watch here. There's a couple of LEDs on the back side of it, so I can kind of see why Apple would be very interested in using those LEDs to essentially illuminate the skin um, and try to detect glucose through the skin. Now, C8 attempted this in a similar way. Similar way they were trying to use Rama spectroscopy. Um, they weren't successful. I think they must have spent over $50 million doing it. Um, but they, they weren't successful, but I think some of the engineers have ended up at Apple. So Apple's now doing a not, not so dissimilar technology, but Apple is interested in uh, shortwave infrared and medium wave infrared. So this is a kind of a, a sense that history, we don't necessarily move on with our trends and our directions. We sometimes return to something that's been tried in the past, but in a slightly, let's say, different way. Um, now, what um, C8 and now Apple are trying to do is photospectroscopy. So let me just give you some personal um, thoughts and opinions around photospectroscopy. This is the infrared spectrum of glucose. Um, it has a broad uh, absorption here and a lot of um, sharper absorptions here. So glucose, you know, that, there's some strong absorptions there. Great. We, we should be able to detect that by shining an LED through the skin, maybe looking at the transmitted light and saying, okay, that's the spectrum for glucose. Now, the slight problem we have here is this is the spectrum for um, water. Um, it also has a broad spectrum here, but hey, it's different here. So if you looked at the spectrum for glucose and the spectrum for water, you might be able to build yourself a mental argument that, you know, in the in blood, which is, you know, essentially you know it's, it's mostly water we should be able to detect peaks for glucose i just want to show you the spectrum for acetaminophen i think that's acetaminophen and it has a um, an absorption here and a lot of spiky absorptions here and it would be similar for ascorbic acid and things like paracetamol the reason i'm showing you these three spectrums is to say glucose looks a bit like water and it looks a bit like acetaminophen it's actually quite hard to find um, part of the photospectrum spectrum that's very indicative of glucose and it's not just hard many people have tried it and they've not succeeded and there's a bit of a sort of you know there's a bit of a reason for this and that's because the ratio of water to glucose in the blood is approximately 11,000 to 1. The quantum efficiency of water interacting with a photon relative to glucose is about 2,000 to 1. This means if you were trying to find glucose in among the ocean of water in the blood, you've got a signal that seems to be like something like 22 million to 1. So I'm applauding Apple and you know for, for trying this and you know they've done a you know well you know they've got the kind of money to potentially do it but their signal to noise is so their noise is potentially 22 million to one so in fact they have a very uphill physics battle to actually do this you know, and you can you can bring all the arguments you want in the world in terms of their budgets um 
but you can also you can also look at history and just say it's not just um, C8 who've tried this. Actually, quite a few companies um, have definitely tried um, this. So we'll come off this now, and now I'm just going to talk about um, one of the directions for um, glucose sensing and biosensing in general is people are very interested in long-term implantables. If you're looking for a current mover and shaker in the long-term implantables, and it's worth looking at Sensionics. This is their technology. Essentially, it's something that's intended to go under the skin and remain in place for something like 365 days. They're not... I didn't explicitly say this, but most of the technologies I've talked about so far in continuous glucose monitoring are electrochemical sensors. Um, Sensionics here are actually using a fluorescence-based um, technique where they have a complex which has a certain fluorescence um, and then the glucose binds with it, it changes the conformation slightly and it changes the signal. Um, it's fine. I mean, that whether you use fluorescence or electrochemistry, you know, there's pros and cons both ways. It's not the thing that makes or breaks your product. Um, I have been f following this company for quite a few years. They seem to have, you know, they seem to be sort of diminishing. But then just at the beginning of 2021, actual share price really jumped up. So there's some sort of announcement at this beginning of this year that's really caused the share price to go up. So people are very interested in long-term implantable sensors. Um, whether this company goes on to be extremely successful, I think we still have to watch it, but it is something that in some ways um, we've got some really good technologies out there from Abbott and Medtronic and Dexcom for continuously glucose monitoring. But people still have to put these technologies on. They still have to, you know, remember to wear them. They have to change the sensors. They have to pierce their skin. You know, people don't want this kind of interaction. You know, they just want to, you know, forget it. And maybe the Sensionics product offers that potential that, you know, you can, you, but it's quite invasive to put it in. So we have to see how well this actually plays out. But, you know, the, you know at least they're trying, let's say. Um, now, I said that this is a, talk about trends and directions in um, biosensing. So we've talked a lot about human health today, especially through the glucose sensor. Now at the ZP, we also see new markets. So this is a new product that we're developing. It's a little um, sensor. Um, this is what the Altronics looks like. And what this is for is um, it's a the Altronics is able to um, run two biosensors at a time. So we've got it um, configured to measure um, glucose and cortisol. And I've got the word aqu um, aquaculture and veterinary here. It's very important for anyone who is interested in biosensor development to not necessarily be focused on the human market. There's already three big players in that market. Um, there's other people trying to get into that market. There's a prize worth winning there, but it's very competitive. You can also go and compete in more in different spaces, and so you know, we, for example, um, are working in the um, measuring the glucose in fish. Um, Zimmer Peacock, as I say, the, the laboratory I'm sitting in today is in the UK. This is what our UK hub. We also have a big presence in Norway, and the reason that's relevant is because the second biggest econ or second biggest market. Um, or industry in Norway is salmon farming and so there's a big interest to monitor the health of the fish and that's why we've ended up developing this um, little capsule that goes into fish and so far we've had continuous operation of these types of sensors for 125, 125 days. Don't forget Sensionics are, are suggesting that they could do 365 days so we've got a long way to go yet. But I suppose this makes the point that we're doing it electrochemically, they're doing it fluorescence. It's not about whether you use fluorescence or electrochemistry. It's a lot, you know, making a long-term implantable is a lot more difficult than just which of those modalities you choose. I'm sure they'll both be fine in the end. The reason that we've got all these little arrows is because we're just intervening on occasions and just putting zero millimolar glucose in just to make sure that the sense is still responding and yeah, it's still responding. So. We're quite happy with that. Now, well, the, the question everyone will ask me is, um, um, how do you stop biofouling? And the answer is, biofouling is the biggest problem 
when it comes to implantable sensors. I can't sit here and say I've got the magic solution to it. Um, we have to compensate for biofouling. We can't destroy or stop biofouling. So if any of you are interested in a real-world problem to solve, um, stop the biofouling or encapsulation of implantable objects or implanted objects in the human body would be a really good thing to solve, but we have not solved it. Hands up, we have not solved it. Um, I had a good friend, I could say, on LinkedIn who just um, quoted me hunting the deceitful turkey. So if you're looking for trends and directions in biosensing, and that could involve glucose sensing, then do learn a, um, a lesson from history, which is you know read the um, hunting the deceitful turkey. Just Google that term, hunting the deceitful turkey. Um, you should find this book. It's free online, um, and it'll just tell you about the history so far in CGM, and it could you know prevent you from repeating some of the mistakes of the past. So just on hydration, just quickly. Um, there's a company out there called Nix that's working on um, hydration sensor. Um, and there's a company called, I think they're called LDLBSX. Um, both companies are trying to get to the market with the hydration sensor. What I found interesting about um, the second company was they were actually using, I think, infrared spectroscopy. Now, not to detect glucose, but actually to detect water. And that does seem like a much more sensible idea because. I just argued that water was by far a bigger signal when you're thinking about photospectroscopy than glucose. So at least these guys are using that and saying, let's use that absorption spectrum for water to quantify the water. So it's a clever idea. But um, I can't, I think this company struggled a bit with this technology, but it's not on the market yet. But people are very interested in hydration monitoring. It's, I think, just a challenging application. It seems so easy and intuitive, but... It's the devils in the detail, I've got a suspicion. So I'm here to talk about trends and directions in biosensing. Um, you know, people are very used to testing blood. Let's have a quick look, actually. People are very used to testing blood. People are very interested in sweat. Um, people, because of COVID-19, are uh, becoming quite interested in saliva. But one of my good colleagues told me, you know, don't tell people that saliva is a new blood because it's, it's a complicated matrix, and I think he's got a good point there. If you're wanting to detect um, pathogens and viruses, maybe saliva is good, but for other things like glucose and lactate, it might be quite challenging. Um, I'm not going to talk about the eye today. I mean, that Google contact lens, that was, a, that was an old technology by the time Google got it. It'd been around for quite a few years, but I'm not going to talk about eye, but it's interesting technology, interesting application. I'm going to talk about the breath today. Um, I love the breath. Um, now, the breath has become very popular over the last few years, and I think a lot of credit for that popularity in the breath needs to be given to a company called Owlstone. This is Owlstone's technology. Um, they, they're well-funded. Um, I think they might even be funded in part by Foxcom, which is a big company that also manufactures the um, iPhone. I think they might be funded by Foxcom. That needs to be looked into a bit more. Anyway, they're a well-funded company. Um, they have really promoted um, the breath. Um, if you look at their website, you can see all the companies that they've actually interacted with. So you know, you've got Samsung up here. Um, you've got AstraZeneca. You know GSK. So some of the biggest pharmaceuticals in the world. Um, some big U.S. institutions like the Cleveland Clinic. Now, what I find interesting is um, I thought that this device used to be a breath system, but actually what it is a breath collection system, and they take the cartridges, I believe, and actually test those on a third-party device. So it's really a breath collection system. So they have, um, they have advertised this system for um, doing what they call breath biopsy, but it's really a breath collection system and not a breath and analysis system. Um, they've done lots of clinical trials. They've done one for detecting lung cancer. That would seem like an obvious one. If you a breath and you're going to do a, you know, be able to detect something, maybe lung cancer would be one of the ones to do. They're trying to detect asthma. That would seem like an obvious one to do on the breath. Um, colorectal cancer. 
and they're also interested in looking at multiple cancers. It's like a fishing trip, trying to find biomarkers on the breath for detecting cancer. Now, none of these, I think, have as such become killer applications for them, and because their hypothesis is this. Um, the interesting biomarkers on the breath um, are in the what's called our VOCs, volatile organic compounds. So their whole hypothesis is we will detect the breath, we will look in the gas phase, and we'll look at the VOCs and be able to tell you, you know, whether you have lung cancer or not. But of course, that hypothesis is all built on the on the on the assumption that it's the VOCs that are indicative of cancer. If the interesting biomarkers are actually in the vapor phase, then their technology won't detect it. So, for example, you know, if they were trying to detect COVID-19 virus directly, they wouldn't find it in the gas phase because it's actually in the vapor phase. So I think this is why, though they've done a lot of studies and had a lot of interest, it's not quite broken through yet. And I think it's because they're unfortunately looking in the wrong place. I have a strong interest in this particular company, I, um, so I can't give an unbiased opinion on it. So you know, just accept that. But I would say this: there's another company out there called um, Exhalation um, Breath Technologies, or Exhalation Health rather. They've got something that you blow into, but this device is different because it's collecting the breath vapor. So I think that if I have COVID-19, it's not in the gas phase, it's in the vapor phase. How am I going to analyze the breath? I need to condense it and then detect it. So they have a technology that, depending on which sensors they use, they can detect hydrogen peroxide for a disease called COPD, chronic obstructionary pulmonary disease. If you're here to receive a talk on um, trends in biosensing, then COPD is an important acronym for you because in the future, unfortunately, a lot of people who smoke today will have COPD in the future. So there's going to be a, you know, a billion, it might not go that high, but there'll be a lot of people who will need to control and monitor a disease called COPD. So they have a biomarker for COPD, it's called hydroperoxide, um, and they can detect that. They were also able to pivot at the beginning of um, 2020 and detect SARS-CoV-2 on the breath. Um, and so this is a very kind of clever company that, in contrast to Alstone, who look at the gas phase, they look at the vapor phase. Um, and I'm going to slightly change pace now and kind of say that, you know, we're here to talk about trends and directions in biosensing. And some of the growth in biosensing is driven by IoT. We run the ZP Developer Zone and you know, I know a lot of people there are interested in IoT and um, the Internet of Things. With the Internet of Things, you know, people want to put sensors in everything. They want to instrumentize it. But the big gap is the chemical sensors, you know, uh, measuring glucose in, in the urine, measuring the pH of urine, maybe measuring lactate in the sweat. These kind of sensors do not exist. You can find, um, yeah, you can find versions of these on the Zimmer Peacock website, but as such, you know, there's not a there's not a plethora of sensors. If you were looking for a carbon dioxide sensor, you could find several man several manufacturers of that. There's a lot of gas phase carbon dioxide sensors, but if you were looking for a um, a pH sensor for the blood, yeah, you could probably find more of those sensors. This wasn't a good example, but trying to find a cortisol in sweat sensor, there's not many of those. Um, apart from us. So there's a big gap in the market for um, biosensors because of the interest in the Internet of Things. And the Internet of Things, for me, is one of the futures for sensing and biosensing. The Internet of Things is driving low power. So low power Bluetooth is in part driven by the Internet of Things. It's great for us biosensor guys. Um, the Internet of Things is and the wearables application is driving the miniaturization. People want smaller, smaller devices. Um, one of the things that's driving us in the Internet of Things is connectivity, you know, that we can connect to the Internet so much more readily these days. One of the things that's driving us in biosensors and the Internet of Things is cloud computing. Um, a question came up earlier on about accuracy. How do we do accuracy? 
it's now because we're now able to send complicated data to the internet and we can use quite powerful computers to crunch that data. That's really going to help us with our accuracy. So we need cloud computing. Um, we got great data scientists. Um, you know, so many engineers nowadays, you know, they might be a biologist, they might be a chemist, they might be a material science. Oh, and by the way, they code in Python. Those are the kind of, you know, engineers of the future because they have their hardcore skills, but they also have their data scientist skills. That are really driving the biosensor world as well as smartphones, you know, and smartphones fit into that connectivity as well. You know, that smartphone not only displays data, it can send data to the cloud and receive information back from the cloud. So the Internet of Things is driving new markets, and one of the markets it's driving is um, agriculture. I have to apologize to a few of our ZP Developer Zone regulars like Ali and Aftab. We've seen this slide millions of times, but it, it is relevant. So what is the future and direction of sensing and biosensing? And agriculture is one of the directions of futures of biosensing. Let me give you a case study on it. I'm going to talk fast. It's 46 minutes, and I'm I don't really want to go much over an hour. Um, so what is the problem in agriculture? Or one of the problems in agriculture is farmers want to have the most, the highest yields in their fields. So therefore they're adding nitrate. The nitrate is meant to be taken up by the roots of the plants and become biomass. But what's happening is um, if you can't measure the nitrate, you don't know how much nitrate to put on there. So you put as much as you think you need. But if you put excess nitrate on, it's going to end up in the local rivers. If you um, put nitrate and fertilizers in the local rivers, the algae will bloom, they will grow, they will consume the oxygen, and the fish will die. So you will have a local pollution incident. Also, the nitrate can seep down into the um, groundwater and essentially acidify and poison the groundwater. So you don't want to add too much nitrate. And if you add too much nitrate in the soil, you're just going to waste it because the um, soil bacteria will just digest it and you'll lose it back into the atmosphere. So how do you improve? If you want to improve something, you probably have to measure it. And if you're going to measure it, you probably need some sensors. So what we've come up with is a nitrate sensing system that's permanently in the soil, measuring the nitrate, sending. This comes back to the Internet of Things slide earlier on. We have to have connectivity. We send the nitrate data to the um, cloud. From there, we can then transmit it to people's smartphones like the farmers, and then they can make smart decisions around um, nitrate monitoring. So just background to the nitrate sensor. Um, it was invented by Professor Tony Miller. Um, and at ZP, what we've done is we've turned them into actual products. So I haven't rightly so talked about Zimmer and Peacock too much, but our, basically our business is um, the development and manufacture of electrochemical biosensors and getting them to the market. Um, and this is an example where we took a very fine academic's ideas and actually made a robust product and put it on the market. Now, what this rod system is doing is it's delivering nitrate sensors deep into the soil at 60 centimeters and 30 centimeters. It has electronics on it and it has connectivity to the web. So we have a transmitter. Um, these are what the sensors. Uh, the reason I've got these photos in here is that we've also got these sensors sitting under water. You can imagine how robust the sensing system has to be in order to um, actually work um, in the soil. So we've had to sink these sensors under water, make sure the ingression of liquid doesn't mess them up. And this is a 90 centimeter version. And you can see there's a lot of engineering in this, um, but the sensors themselves are absolutely tiny. So there's all this infrastructure to deliver quite a tiny sensor. Um, this is just us actually in the electronics underwater just to make sure that, I think we left them under the weekend, just to make sure that the liquid was, yeah, the liquid didn't get in there and mess up the sensor. Field installation, so we've taken these sensors out and we've put them into um, fields. You can see that, you know, we have to consider the power because they have to be run by photovoltaics, which was one of the Internet of Things that we were talking about earlier on. Let's talk about the data. So the data looks a bit like this. We take these rods, we put them in the field. This is what now this data, when you look at it, 
you know, there's a lot of lines here. So let me just take you through what's happening. Events. So this is the addition of nitrate by the farmer. It happens on the 30th of March, 2021. This is the nitrate data. So we're looking at 20 ppm. And even though he's added nitrate, on about the 14th of April, the nitrate starts going down. So Ali and Aftab, who are regulars to our channel, know what's happening here. The, um, the soil is drying out, at which point we have some rainfall and the nitrate jumps up. So we're in a very funny situation here that we've added nitrate to the soil on the 30th of March. On the 14th of April, it's just going down. And why is this? Well, all the time the soil is actually drying out. So the available nitrate is going down. Why? Because the ground's drying out. If a plant's to absorb nitrate, it needs to be you know, in the liquid form. And if the soil is drying out, then it's not in the liquid form. When the rain comes, then suddenly the nitrate jumps up and the nitrate is actually trending upwards. The re th this new arrow here on the 8th of May is because a second dose of nitrate has been added by the farmer. So he's added a dose of nitrate. He hasn't seen the benefit of the dose of nitrate until it rains. And something like um, three days later, he adds a second dose of nitrate, uh, which you know goes on top of the first dose of nitrate. So he's effectively added a dose of nitrate, never seen the benefit of it. The rain comes, he starts seeing the benefit, and he immediately adds another dose of nitrate. So that scenario where I kind of suggested that, you know, because farmers are not able to monitor the nitrate, they might be adding too much nitrate and it might be running into the river courses. I mean, this is this is, would be clear from this data that he didn't need to add that second dose of nitrate because he was already only just about witnessing the benefit of the first dose of nitrate. All the time it's raining, he adds some more nitrate, but his nitrate's actually kind of trending upwards. So even while it's trending upwards, he adds some more nitrate. So that could be argued that you are, you know, you are dosing. He's gone up to like 45 ppm and he's still dosing nitrate. Um, but in fact, what happens is it stops raining, the nitrate goes down, and he does not see the benefit of all this until it rains again. So if he had this data, I think he would have come up with a very different application scenario for that nitrate. But he didn't have the data, so he just is essentially blind. And this is probably the reason why we are getting over fertilization and run off into our water courses because these nitrate sensors are not in the hands of farmers. Thankfully, they're coming now. Um, so we're running um, a beta test program for this. It's free. There's a website out there um, called ZP Ag Tech. And if you want to know about the technology, um, just take a quick look at that um, website. Um, slight change of pace now. I've said that we were going to talk about trends of technology in markets and i have talked about trends of technology i talked about transdermal sensors micro needles reverse iontophoresis and photospectroscopy i changed and said let's talk about agriculture it's an interesting market for sensors now i'm going to talk about another market which is um chemical sensor for, for food quality um i like this this slide is is something that i think there's a technology which is ready to come which is electronic tongue and electronic nose. Anyone who's worked in biosensors for some time knows that people have been working on the electronic nose and the electronic tongue for absolute ages, but they've not quite found a product that well regarded and has really been adopted is not quite on the market for these things. But I think it's a technology that's ready to come now. And the reason I think it's ready to come is because you can buy a glucose sensor for sweetness you can buy a ph sensor for soundness you can buy a sodium sensor for saltiness you know we can even put all of these sensors in one little package you know so you can have a credit card which can have all the sensors in place you know so you can at least get the raw signal for sweet sour and salty the electronics exist and importantly ai exists i mean you know what is an out what is a nose and what is a tongue what is the sensation of smell and what is the sensation of taste? The sensation of taste and smell is chemical sensors in the tongue called receptors, which witness this sweet and sour and saltiness. And then there's a brain, which is a neural network that converts that, um, those signals into, you know, into feelings, into an experience. 
so we have all the pieces now. We have the sensors, we have the electronics, and we have AI. And you know, five years ago, people were saying, "Oh, we need to get into AI." Now we actually are in getting into AI. You know, so I think AI is the technology that makes all of the, makes the electronic tongue, the electronic nose, now possible. And even edge computing, which is um, part of this AI movement, is also going to help that. Just on the food industry, this is a technology called Food Sense. It can, at the moment, measure chili, garlic, wine, E. coli, and pH. So I said at the very beginning of this presentation that in the medical industry, people are becoming very interested in point of care technology. In the food industry, they're becoming very interested in the equivalent, which is point of need testing. Um, Point of care, you take a drop of blood, you get an immediate glucose reading. With a chili sensor, you take a drop of chili sauce, you get an immediate reading, and it tells you the hotness of it. So they're different applications, but actually the underlying technology is really quite similar. And because of smartphones, you know, actually you can have one app drive one meter, and you can measure like the hotness of chili, the pungency of garlic, the sulfite in white wine, the ginger oil in ginger, the pH, the curcumin in turmeric, the vanilla aldehyde in vanilla and the CFUs of um, E. coli. So that movement of Internet of Things, that movement of smartphones, the movement of applications, is really marrying together now with biosensing. So we can make essentially one app that can do so many things, but it does take a different sensor each particular time. Um, if you want to be in the food industry today and you want to analyze food, then you might need HPLC, you might need titration, you might need to do plate reading, you might need pH meters, you might need GCMS. And the thing about the food industry, they can't, they really don't have the kind of margins to afford this kind of industry um, technology. The biggest producers possibly can, but many of the small, medium enterprises in the food industry can't afford this. So there's a real gap in the market for biosensor technologies that are low cost. And so, you know, I'll focus just on chili today, but this is a technology that we have. If you look at the competition for a chili sensor, if you ask the question of a food producer, how do you measure the hotness of Tabasco sauce, which is a brand of chili sauce? They might use HPLC. They might use their staff to do a panel test. They might um, do what I call guessing, or they might do um, they might use the food sense technology if they have it. Just as way of background, this food sense technology actually comes from the um, University of Oxford. There's a guy called Richard Compton, very smart electrochemist, um, and he realized that the hotness of chilies is due to a molecule called capsaicin, which he could um, quantify chemistry. Um, and so we were able to sort of take his technology and translate it from laboratory experiments into um, point of need testing in the food industry. And we, we actually, because of, because of where we are in history at this moment, the, the speed of development can now actually um, increase quite a bit. Um, so we live in a, in a rapid era of development. So I've just spent five minutes just running through and saying, look, you know, we're able to develop a sensor for measuring the hotness of chili sauces because we recognize capsaicin. For some markets, people are actually quite interested in measuring you know, new molecules like THC and CBC. And like, um, THC is tetrahydrocannabinoid. It's the active in um, things like marijuana. People are genuinely interested in measuring this these days because um, there's a lot of hemp growers. They have to stay below a certain percentage of THC in the crop for the crop to stay legal. So even though I'm talking about capsaicin, there are many other molecules that you could also be testing in a point of need type situation. I mean, and which, if you're interested in these things, you can develop it yourself, or you can talk to um, companies like um, Zimmer and Peacock. Yeah, so Mohammed, sorry, Aftab's making the point that the thing about electrochemistry as a modality is it is possible to make the electronics really low cost. It, um, you know, and that's proven by glucose meters. Glucose meters, you know, they retail for less than fifty dollars these days. You know, that's not bad for really what's a scientific instrument. So electrochemistry does have a great opportunity for this new point of needs testing. I think it will be electrochemical sensors that does it. Um, I just want to talk about how we're accelerating the development process in our projects. Um, so how we're accelerating it is this. 
people are coming to us or we're doing it ourselves and saying, look, I need a particular biosensor. Let's say it's cortisol. We'll develop a biosensor pretty quickly. Um, now, we have um, a platform which can run, um, if you're an electrochemist, these terms will be familiar to you, but it can run amperometry, square wave voltammetry, differential pulse voltammetry, cycle voltammetry, impedance spectroscopy. So we have a ability to develop sensors quite quickly and an ability to run quite complicated assays um, on this particular meter. Now, with smart guys that you know around the world, we're also able to develop these apps quite quickly. Now, what an app on what these apps on this smartphone does is it says, because of the QR code, the app can see what kind of sensor it is, and the app by Bluetooth then connects to the meter and says, right, this is a cortisol sensor. So the meter says, okay, I'm going to run a cortisol assay. Now the the sample goes on the sensor, the meter runs the experiment, the raw data goes to the meter, the meter sends the raw data back to the app, at which point, uh, this is what I love about Internet of Things and Cloud Computing, you hit the upload button. All the raw data goes straight to our Julie database. So if you're a regular of ZP Developer Zone, you, you'll be nauseous with the amount of times I talk about Julie. But Julie is a, is a cloud database that we run that is able to receive that raw data in Julie. So what that allows us to do is actually analyze the raw data for features. And all we ask in our development programs with our developers is tell us, um, tell us the truth. And what I mean by the truth is, if you're giving us a, a sample and you want us to measure the cortisol, we will measure it and get the raw signal. If there's a golden standard or a golden method for measuring cortisol, and that could be something like um, an ELISA test, Give us the result for that, because that's essentially a label. So in AI, what we want to do is we want to take the label, and we want to take our raw data, and we want to come up with the best algorithm that maps our raw data to the label data. And, that, and essentially, so we get a good, great correlation between biosensor and clinical value. Now, in order to run this workflow, you needed cloud computing, you needed apps, you needed Bluetooth, um, you need a connectivity to the internet. So the workflow is a modern workflow is only possible in this moment in history and going forward. So it wasn't actually something we could have done so regularly five years ago and definitely not so, definitely 10 years ago. So we can now develop at a much faster pace than we could traditionally done it because we actually are able to get the raw data into the right scientist's hands very quickly on real samples. I'm coming, this is almost my last slide now, and I'm just going to just touch upon manufacturing. Um, in the past, or actually, if you look at the electronics industry, so Google the term fabulous manufacturing, and you're going to find out that in the semiconductor industry, in the chip manufacturing world, you have companies that do development, and they own intellectual property, and they own sales. You know, they know where to, they know who to sell it to and how to get it to them. So they have all these things in place. And so that allows um, semiconductor foundries to manufacture on their behalf, and then the company goes out there and sells it. Now, in the biosensor market, we are not doing that. You will find companies start up, they start building their supply chain, their technology, they start doing some manufacturing in-house. They are definitely not fabulous. And you know, most of these companies you know, actually run into manufacturing problems, and they never quite get to market. They don't suffer that problem in the semiconductor industry because they know where to go and get this stuff manufactured. So what my sort of plea is, you know, and I am biased because, you know, I'm a founder of Zimmer and Peacock, but in the future, you will have very successful biosensor companies, which will be described as fabulous biosensor companies, because they will have said, OK, we have a great idea. We have some intellectual property. We've figured out ourselves a marketing plan. But we're not going to invest all of our time and effort in the manufacturing of it. No, we'll find a contract manufacturer to do that. We will be essentially fabulous, and they will do that manufacturing for us. And I think if more startups do that, then essentially the attrition rate in the manufacturing stage, which is one of the harder stages, will go down, and more people will actually get to market. Because everyone keeps on building the same production lines. 
So let me just do a summary. And I've spoken for one minute and five, sorry, one hour and five minutes. So I'm going to go quickly now. So I wanted to talk about health, wellness, and sports. Health is dominated by glucose monitoring. Um, I think in sports, um, people are very interested in lactate, food and agriculture. Elon Musk says to people, he say, apparently he says that, you know, don't go into the financial markets in the future, go into the agritech market. And my advice to you is um, don't go into the financial markets in the future, go into the agritech markets in the future. Feeding the world is going to be one of the big challenges and big opportunities for us in the future. The whole world is going towards point of need testing. The whole world is going towards wearables. I think uh, connectivity and IoT is a big driver of biosensors. Um, please sort of join us in this kind of market if you're not there. AI, if you don't know AI and you don't do data scientists and you're not learning Python, uh, make sure you hire good people who can. And in the future, the electronics industry is already 20 years, 30 years ahead of us on this, but companies may develop IP and they might develop sales and marketing channels, but I think they will actually go to a few key players in order to do that manufacturing. If you think I'm wrong, just look at the semiconductor industry. So that was one hour and six minutes. I've gone six minutes over. And um, like I said, I'm gonna, this, this, this video is going to stay up on YouTube afterwards. I do appreciate... Uh, um, you guys coming along today, and I, uh, a few questions um, came through the, the chat, so I hope I've answered them. I am going to say um, good evening. Um, it's six minutes past um, six in the evening here in the UK, but um, thank you all for um, attending. Um, like I said, I'll leave the video up on YouTube, and any questions, um, maybe join the ZP Developer Zone and be part of the conversation. All right. Take care, guys, and thank you very much. Have a good evening. Bye-bye.